In this short video, we're going to look at one-to-one -one functions and their inverses. So what does it mean for a function to be one-to-one? -one? Well, we say it's one-to-one -one if each member of the range is paired exactly with one member of the domain. In other words, for each y, there is exactly one x. Now, remember that a relation is a function provided that each member of the domain is paired exactly with one member of the range. And that we say means for each x, there is only one y. So now we have it going both directions. For each x, there's only one y. That makes it a function. And then for each y, there is only one x. That makes it a one-to-one -one function. In other words, there is exactly each, for each x, there's exactly one and only one y. And for each y, there's exactly one and only one x that gets paired with it. So if you have two different inputs which give the same output, then it's not one-to-one. -one. So we have many simple examples. Let's use the absolute value function. If you take the absolute value of 2, the answer is 2. If you take the absolute value of negative 2, you still get 2 as your output. So I have two different inputs. They have the same output. This is not a one-to-one -one function. Let's look at some examples. We saw this example in the previous video. We said if we have g of x equals x squared minus x, we'd like to find all x values where g of x equals 6. So we had to solve an equation. It was a quadratic equation. And we found that we got two different inputs whose output is 6. So this cannot be a one-to-one -one function. We had the other example of h of x being 1 over x minus 2. And we said that uh, we'd like to find all values of x where the output is 1. And there was only one value of x, which is 3. And if you think about this, uh, no matter what x value you put in here, the y value that you get out is going to be unique. So it looks like h of x is a one-to-one -one function. If we have the graph of a function, the way that we can test that for each y there is only one x is to use the horizontal line test. So if you have a graph of a function and a horizontal line intercepts that graph in two or more points, then it's not one-to-one. -one. So let's go through a quick example here. We have a bunch of uh, functions. These all do represent functions. Uh, which ones are one-to-one? -one? Well, using the horizontal line test, I can see that going from the top left, that I'll put a check mark if it's one-to-one. -one. Well, let me just write it out. This is indeed one to one. This one, though, you can see I have a horizontal line right here, which will tell me that no, this is not one to one. And again, here, this one will not be one to one. But this one is one to one. I can't take any horizontal line and intersect the curve in more than one place. Uh, this one definitely not. This is a sine function, so it's a periodic function. So uh, it's just the x-axis I could use and see that this is not one-to-one. -one. Right here, I can see maybe this line right here will tell me that this is not one-to-one, -one, but this one does represent a one-to-one -one function.
All right, if we go back to our model, where we think of a function as a machine, then if we have a one-to-one -one function, we could run the machine in reverse. We could put the y in uh, as an input and running it in reverse, I should get the exact same output because it's a one-to-one -one function. Then this re function run in reverse, we call it the inverse function. And we write it as f with a superscript negative one, but that's not an exponent. It's just a shorthand for the idea of inverse. So f inverse, and we write it with f superscript negative one, but it's not an exponent. So we have some really interesting properties of one-to-one uh, -one functions and their inverses. So let's just be clear. Using our function notation, if A is our input to F and B is the output to F, then when I use B as the input to F inverse, the output must be A. So really the role of the input and the output is being swapped when you talk about a function and its inverse. So the domain of f is the range of f inverse. And the range of f is the domain of f inverse. If we have a point with the coordinates a comma b on the graph of uh, f, then b comma a is a point on the graph of f inverse. If I have a vertical asymptote, x equals k on the graph of y equals f of x, I'll have a corresponding horizontal asymptote, y equals k on the graph of f inverse. Same idea with horizontal asymptotes. If y equals h is a horizontal asymptote of f, then x equals h is a vertical asymptote of f inverse. And f is going to be the inverse of f inverse. And that should make sense, right? That uh, if f inverse undoes f, then f should undo f inverse. So in other words, the inverse of f inverse is just f itself. And really the most appropriate thing to say is that f and f inverse are inverses of each other. And so in terms of composition, if we think about what does f composed with f inverse means, it means apply f inverse and then apply f. Well, we said that f undoes f inverse and f inverse undoes f. So if I do something to x and then I undo it, I should get x back again. We saw that in our previous video with the reciprocal function. We said that if you take the reciprocal of a number and then take the reciprocal of the reciprocal, you get the same number back again. So f of f inverse of x is going to be x. And this is one case where the order of composition does not matter, because if I take f inverse composed with f of x, I should get x again, because if I start with x, I do f, and then I undo f, I should get x back again. All right, so how do we sketch the graph of the inverse of a function from the graph of the function? And this is important because sometimes it's very difficult uh, to find the formula or even knowing the formula, it might be difficult to sketch the graph of the inverse of a function. But if we have the graph of the function itself, we can use this technique to find the graph of the inverse function. 
And we're going to use this fact right here, that if we have a comma b on the graph of f, then b comma a must be a point on the graph of f inverse. So here in an example, I have the graph of a function. It has multiple pieces that are connected together. Two of the pieces are a line segment, and then the last piece is a ray. And we'd like to sketch the graph of f inverse. Well, the way we're going to do that is we're going to find some points that are on the graph of f of x. So I started here with 4 comma 3, moved over to 3 comma 1. Oh, I like to pick points where I don't have to do too much estimation. So this point here, negative 2 comma negative 1. And then at the arrow tip, we have negative 4 comma negative 4. So to find the corresponding points on the graph of f inverse, I just swap the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate. So 4 comma 3 becomes 3 comma 4. 3 comma 1 becomes 1 comma 3, and so on. So I can plot those points. 3 comma 4, 1 comma 3, negative 1 comma negative 2, and negative 4 comma negative 4. And then connect those. In this case, I know that the graph of the function consists of straight lines. So I'll know the graph of the inverse will also have straight lines in it. So I'll connect those points with straight lines. In the end, I had an arrow on the original function. I'll put an arrow on the inverse as well. Now, if I look at these two graphs, you can see there is some symmetry. Uh, it's not symmetric with respect to the x-axis or the y-axis. It's symmetric with respect to the diagonal line y equals x. So the line y equals x is a mirror line. The graph of f inverse is the mirror image of the graph of f when reflected in that line y equals x. Let's take a look at another example here. Here I have a smooth curve, uh, and so I don't have straight lines, but I should still be able to use this technique to get a, a rough sketch of the graph of f inverse. And I use the same technique. I'll start by identifying some points. Um, here where x is negative, I'm going to have to do some kind of estimation because there aren't any real nice points that lie on the grid corners. But I can start with negative 1, 1 half. Then here I get 0, 1. No estimation required, 1, 2, and 2, 4. So go ahead and swap those coordinates and plot those new points that I get. And now I'm going to try to connect this with a straight line. Now I'm also going to make note that here it looks like the x-axis is an asymptote, a horizontal asymptote for f. So the y-axis should be a vertical asymptote. So there's the graph of f inverse. And again, x equals 0. That is um, the, see, I made a mistake here. So this is going to happen sometimes. And I am going to need to, because uh, horizontal asymptotes always have y equals so y equals 0 is a horizontal asymptote, and x equals 0 is a vertical asymptote for the inverse. If I'm given the function, a function, and I'm asked to find the equation of its inverse, how can I do that? Well, uh, sometimes it can be very challenging, but for most situations, there's a basic four-step process. We're going to go ahead and replace the uh, function notation. Now, here I put f of x, but it could be any 
name, function name. We're going to replace that with y. We're going to interchange x and y, meaning that wherever you see an x, you replace it with y. And wherever you see a y, you're going to replace it with x. And then we'll solve the new equation for y. And I write that as one step, but that's going to be most of the work involved. And once after I solve it for y, I'm going to go ahead and replace y with f inverse of x. So let's look at some examples. First example, we have this rational function f of x equals 3x plus 1 over x minus 2. So our first step would be to go ahead and replace f of x with y. Now, note that x equals 2 is a vertical asymptote for f. So at the end, as a check, I'm going to see if y equals 2 is a horizontal asymptote. If y equals 2 is not a horizontal asymptote of the inverse, then I made a mistake. So replace Wherever I see an x, I've replaced it with a y, and I replace my y with x. Now I want to solve this for y. So I have to sharpen up my algebra tools. I'm going to multiply both sides by y minus 2 in parentheses. Then I'll remove the parentheses. And then I want to collect all of the terms that have a y on one side all of the terms that don't have a y on the other side of the equation so that I can factor out the y. And then I'll divide both sides of this equation by the quantity x minus 3. And now when I look at this, oh yeah, sure enough, uh, if you remember from algebra, your horizontal asymptote when you have a rational function where the degree of the top is the same as the degree of the bottom is just the ratio of the lead coefficients. So it would just be 2 over 1. So y equals 2 is a horizontal asymptote for this function. And I guess I should also look up here in my original function, 3 is a horizontal asymptote. And in my inverse, x equals 3 is a vertical um, uh, asymptote. And so the last step is to replace that y with f inverse of x. All right, let's look at another example. And in this example, I'm going to have to be a little bit more careful. Uh, because, well, we'll see. So f of x is radical 2x minus 5. Now I want to emphasize that this radical sign represents the positive square root. Every number has two square roots. The radical sign only denotes the positive square root. So I'll replace f of x with y. And this is where I have to be careful because to solve, I'm sorry. And again, I want to emphasize that uh, here, my y values must be positive because it's the positive square root. And I'll go ahead and swap the x and y. And note that this means that x has to be positive is now x equals radical 2y minus 5. Well, why am I writing this inequality down x greater than or equal to 0? Because the next step is to square both sides. And now I've lost some information when I do that. When I square both sides, it's not clear. Now I have x squared. And am I interested in the positive square root of x or the negative square root of x? That's why I have to explicitly write down that x should be greater than or equal to 0. Now I go ahead and solve that equation for y. And I get y equals 1 half parentheses 
x squared plus 5. But again, we're only interested in the part where x is greater than or equal to 0. So I have to restrict the domain. And it should be pretty clear why. If I don't restrict the domain, I would be looking at the graph of a parabola. And we know from the horizontal line test that the graph of a parabola does not represent a one-to-one -one function. So what this is telling us is that we're only going to take one branch of the parabola, and that will be a one-to-one -one function. So if we didn't have that restriction on the domain, I would not have a one-to-one -one function. And if it's not a one-to-one -one function, then it doesn't make sense that it could be the inverse of something. Because if a function is one-to-one, -one, it, it has an inverse, and its inverse must be one-to-one. -one. So let's look at a more complicated example here. Here we're looking at the negative square root, so the negative radical sign, that's why I need this negative sign here, of the quantity 5 minus x raised to the 2 thirds power, all raised to the power of 3. Now, because of this restriction that I can only have a positive number under the radical sign, then there's definitely a restriction on x. When x uh, is bigger than, uh, well, if I took something and subtracted something bigger than 5, then uh, I would get a negative number here. So I can't have a negative number. And so I am uh, going to uh, put the restriction that x should be between 0 and 5 raised to the power of 3 halves. Uh, because if I take 5 raised to the power of 3 halves, and I raise that to the 2 thirds power, I'll get 5. So if anything bigger than that would give me a negative number, and that would be not a real number after I take the radical of it. And that means that y, the outputs, are going to be between uh, negative 5 radical 5. And where did the 5 radical 5 come from? Well, uh, 5 raised to the 3 halves power is 5 to radical 5. And so uh, the outputs then uh, can be negative. So when I have uh, x equals to 0, I'll get negative 5 radical 5, and then when x equals 5 to the 3 halves power, I'll get 0. So my inputs are restricted, and my outputs are also restricted. Why do I need to do that? Well, let's look at the graph of this function without any restrictions. It has two branches, so it starts here at uh, on the x-axis, goes down to a cusp on the y-axis, and then goes back up to the x-axis. And so um, if I don't have this restriction on x, then I would not have a one-to-one -one function. So if I put the restriction on x, then I only get one of the branches, in this case, the branch where x is positive, And now I have a one-to-one -one function. So I need to restrict this domain in order to get a one-to-one -one function. So again, look at what is the difference? It's the same formula, but now I added a restriction on the domain. And that means I only have one branch, making it a one-to-one -one function. So again, here's a reminder that uh, 5 to the 3 halves power means radical 5 cubed, and that's the same as 5 radical 5. We'll be using a lot of expressions where we have things, numbers raised to the 3 halves power, and so um, it's really clean to write it in this way as 
the number times the radical of the same number. So let's go through our steps. We'll replace f with y. I have to keep the restriction though. I have both restrictions on x and on y. And now I'll swap the x and the y. That means I do the same with the restrictions. And now this is where the algebra gets uh, uh, a bit challenging. Uh, the first step isn't too bad. I want to undo the radical. So I'm squaring both sides. And just like we saw in the simpler example, as soon as I square both sides, it's no longer clear whether I was looking at the negative square root or the positive square root. Uh, but since we know that from our restrictions that x is negative, yeah, now we know it, it was the negative square root. That information gets preserved with the restriction. So how do I undo the cube? Well, I take the cube root. And the, the cube root is the same as uh, raising to the power of one third. So I raise both sides to the one third power. So now I'll have x squared to the one third power. You can multiply the exponents together to get x to the two thirds power equals five minus y to the two thirds power. So I'll get the y term by itself which means I'll have to add y to the two-thirds to each side and then subtract x to the two-thirds power from each side. Now I want to get y by itself. Well, I'm going to start by cubing both sides. Remember, y to the two-thirds power means y squared and then take the cube root. So to undo the cube root, I'm going to cube both sides. Now I'll be left with y squared. And now we see why writing down these restrictions is important. If I leave it the way it's written, um, without the restrictions, we wouldn't know um, what square root to take. And we would not have a uh, one to one function. In fact, without both of these restrictions, I wouldn't even have a function itself. But I want y to be a positive number. It should go between 0 and 5 radical 5. So I'll use the positive square root. Now, since I put the positive square root in there, um, I don't need to write this restriction on y. It doesn't hurt, uh, but it just was there to tell me, do I need the positive square root or the negative square root? And I needed the positive square root. And so I can switch to the f inverse notation. So it looks uh, very interesting, right, that the formula for f and the formula for f inverse are very similar. The only thing that's different is that we have the minus or the negative square root in f. We have positive square root in f inverse. But our restriction is different. Here we want x to be positive. The inputs to f are positive numbers. The input to f inverse are negative numbers. And if we look at the graph of f and f inverse, here's the graph of f. And of course, you have that symmetry with respect to the line y equals x. So it makes sense that, oh yeah, if x was positive, only, only had positive values, in the function, then it should have only negative values with the uh, inverse. And uh, same idea with the, the y coordinates. So we've had a couple of examples where we had to have restricted domains in order to create a one to one function. And you can do this a lot. If you restrict, uh, uh, think about it this way. If you have a graph of something that maybe is not even a function, but if you just zoom in on one piece of that graph, not only does it represent a function, but it could represent a one-to-one -one function. 
So if we have a given equation, it may not represent a function or may not represent a one-to-one -one function, right? Our classic example would be the y equals x squared. Its graph is a parabola. And, but if I only take one branch of that parabola, I could take the negative branch or the positive branch or a portion of the positive branch or the portion of the negative branch, meaning where x equals x is negative or x is positive. So if we restrict ourselves to where x is positive, you get this branch and that magenta line represents a one to one function while the entire graph does not. Let's take another simple example, the unit circle. It's neither a function, it's definitely not going to be a one-to-one -one function. So you can't think of it as a y as a function of x or x as a function of y. But if I start focusing on only parts of that circle, so if I only look at the upper semicircle, that's the same as solving for the positive square root here in for y, y equals positive square root of one minus x squared. I've got a function, but it's not one to one. So if in addition to restricting y, I also restrict x, and maybe I only take the positive values of x, now I've got a not only a function, but a one to one function. So we've done a lot of algebra here with uh, one to one functions. Our next video will be to do some calculus with one-to-one -one functions.